Welcome to Hollywood Graveyard, where we set out to remember and celebrate the lives of those who lived to entertain us, by visiting their final resting places. Today we're back at Westwood Village Memorial Park, where we'll find such stars as Kirk Douglas, Mary Carlyle, Tim Conway, and many more. Join us, won't you? Can you believe it's been almost three years since we were last here at Westwood Village Memorial Park? My goodness, where does the time go? We're back today to visit some stars we missed in our previous tours, and to visit others that we've lost since. You'll recall that though Westwood is a tiny cemetery, it packs a powerful celebrity punch, with more stars per capita than just about any other cemetery in the world, including one of the most visited grave sites in the world, that of Marilyn Monroe. If you're short on time and can only visit one cemetery in LA, Westwood might just be the one to hit. This marks video number five here at Westwood, so if you haven't done so already, be sure to check out parts one through four. We'll begin our tour today following along the outer periphery before moving into the central lawn. Let's head into the Sanctuary of Tenderness. Here we find the crypt of actor Christopher George, He's best remembered for starring in the 60s TV series The Rat Patrol as Sergeant Sam Troy. The role earned him a Golden Globe nomination for Best Male TV Star. After The Rat Patrol, he starred in the series The Immortal, as well as a number of films, including Mortuary, his final film. As a military veteran, George would also entertain troops on USO tours. Christopher George died from a heart attack at just 52. A contributing factor is said to have been an injury he sustained on the set of The Rat Patrol when he was in a vehicle rollover accident. If you've ever watched a movie in Panavision, you have this man to thank, Robert Gottschalk. He was an inventor and entrepreneur who specialized in camera lenses, specifically anamorphic and wide-angle lenses and projection lenses. He founded Panavision in 1953, coinciding with the widescreen boom of the 50s, to provide projection lenses for cinemascope films. Before that time, films were typically made and projected with a much narrower field of view, closer to a square than a wide rectangle that we're used to seeing today. An early example of a film made with the Panavision process was Ben-Hur. Gottschalk was awarded two special Oscars for his contributions to the technology of filmmaking. In 1982, Robert Gottschalk was found dead in his home. He was stabbed to death by his male lover, who was convicted of his murder and sentenced to prison. Let's continue along this road to the northeast corner of the cemetery. This is the Room of Prayer, which you'll generally find locked. In our previous tour, we visited the legendary Robert Stack, host of Unsolved Mysteries and star of The Untouchables. Resting alongside Robert is his wife, Rosemary Bo Stack. As an actress, the exotic Rosemary is best remembered for starring roles in adventure films of the 50s, like The Golden Mistress and The Adventures of Haji Baba. She can also be seen alongside her husband in the 1986 film Big Trouble, after which she retired from acting. She was married to Robert Stack from 1956 until his death in 2003. Rosemary lived to be 86, passing away in 2019. Let's turn south now and head into the Sanctuary of Remembrance. Low on the back wall we find the niche of Percy Helton. He was a familiar face and voice in Hollywood for some 50 years. His films include 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Spook Chasers, and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And he had regular appearances on most of the great TV shows of the 50s and 60s, including as Homer Cratchit on the Beverly Hillbillies. Percy Helton lived to be 77. High on this same wall is South African-born actor Cecil Kellaway. He was nominated for two Oscars in his career, for The Luck of the Irish and Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. He also had memorable roles in the 1942 comedy I Married a Witch, and in the 1946 noir film The Postman Always Rings Twice. Kellaway would turn to television in the 50s and 60s, including as Jeremy Wickwire in one of my favorite episodes of The Twilight Zone, Elegy. Now you tell us one thing right now. Where are we? Why, you're in a cemetery. Didn't you know? Cecil Kellaway lived to be 82. Let's head to the next corridor south to find the crypt of Isabel Bigley. She began her career singing and performing on stage in the 1950s. 
She was performing in Oklahoma when she was offered the role of Sarah Brown in the original Broadway production of Guys and Dolls. The role earned her the Tony for Best Actress in a Musical. She subsequently played the role of Jeannie in Rodgers and Hammerstein's Me and Juliet, a role created with her in mind. She would also perform on variety shows in early television. Isabel died from pulmonary disease at the age of 80. Along this southern road is a veritable walk of fame of the dead, including the likes of Farrah Fawcett, Walter Matthau, and Rodney Dangerfield. At the end of the row is Spartacus himself, the legendary Kirk Douglas. Born Isser Danilovich, Kirk Douglas would embody the square-jawed, tough leading man of the 50s and 60s, and become a true Hollywood icon. He's most often recognized for his title role in the 1960 film, Spartacus. The symbol of the Senate, all the power of Rome. I imagine a god for slaves, and I pray. What do you pray for? I pray for a son who will be born free. Not only did he star as Spartacus, he produced and helped break the Hollywood blacklist by hiring Dalton Trumbo to write the screenplay. Kirk Douglas would earn three Oscar nominations in his career for Champion, The Bad and the Beautiful, and Lust for Life, in which he portrayed Vincent Van Gogh. In addition to his numerous Hollywood accolades, Kirk Douglas received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1981 for his goodwill efforts. He died in 2020 at the age of 103, at the time one of the very last surviving stars of Hollywood's golden age. He was the father of actor Michael Douglas and Eric Douglas, who died in 2004 and rests alongside him. Let's turn left toward the mausoleum and stop at this wall of niches, where we find Joseph von Sternberg. He was an Austrian-American filmmaker of both the silent and talky eras. He's best known for his frequent collaboration with screen legend Marlena Dietrich, directing her in films like The Blue Angel, Shanghai Express, and The Devil is a Woman. He received two Oscar nominations in his career for Shanghai Express and Morocco. Joseph von Sternberg was a master cinematographer, his use of light and dark in his films creating a stunning and unique visual aesthetic. Later in his career, he taught film at UCLA. Among his students were Jim Morrison and Ray Manzarek, who would form the band The Doors and cite Sternberg as a major influence. He died after suffering a heart attack at age 75. Rounding the corner, we find the crypt of a comedy legend, Tim Conway. He appeared in hundreds of film and TV productions beginning in the 60s and made us laugh the whole way. He's perhaps best remembered for teaming up with other comic legends like Harvey Korman and Carol Burnett on The Carol Burnett Show in the 60s and 70s, which would earn him a Golden Globe. One of the truly legendary moments in sketch comedy history happened between Corman and Conway in the sketch, The Dentist. Doctor, if it's gonna hurt, please give me something to kill the pain. Yeah, okay, well, I've got some Novocaine right here. Just, uh, hold on that, man, let's see how this works here. Okay, Novocaine, here we are, Novocaine. Take a firm hold of the hypodermic needle. Right. <laughs> Tim Conway is also remembered as Ensign Charles Parker on McHale's Navy, and for you younger audiences out there, as the voice of Barnacle Boy on SpongeBob SquarePants. He even had his own show, The Tim Conway Show, and continued to make appearances on sitcoms and variety shows into his 80s. The beloved comic passed away in 2019 at the age of 85. We're back at the Garden of Serenity in the southern end of the cemetery. Here is the niche of another man who kept us laughing, Kip Adada, the comedian of the United States. He was a stand-up comedian who regularly appeared on late night talk shows, variety shows, and game shows in the 70s and 80s. He also did comedy recordings for the Dr. Demento radio show, like Life in the Slaw Lane. On the other hand, even though peaches could be the pits, I knew she'd never call the fuzz. Life in the slaw lane. And Wet Dream, replete with fish puns. I slipped him a fin on porpoise. I was feeling good. I even dropped a sand dollar in a box for Jerry squids for the halibut. Kip also appeared in a handful of films, including 1976's Bound for Glory. He died in 2019 at the age of 75. West of here is the Rose Garden area, where cremated remains are scattered. 
There are small plaques commemorating those scattered here, among them actress Nancy Kelly. She began performing on stage and screen as a child, and by 1939 found herself starring alongside Tyrone Power in Jesse James. But Nancy is perhaps best remembered for her role as Christine in The Bad Seed. The stage version earned her a Tony Award, and the 1956 film adaptation earned her an Oscar nomination. Her later years were mainly spent in television. She died from complications of diabetes at the age of 73. Let's head around the corner to find two more stars. Here is Mary Carlyle. While perhaps less remembered today, she was a bright star in the 30s and 40s, known for playing the wholesome ingenue in musical comedy films of the era. Her films include College Humor, The Sweetheart of Sigma Chi, and This Side of Heaven. Her final film was of a different flavor, a 1943 horror called Dead Men Walk. She retired after making this film and marrying James Blakely. And if you thought Kirk Douglas had longevity, Mary here lived to be 104, passing away in 2018. Mary's husband James Blakely also worked in the entertainment biz. He acted in a handful of films in the 30s, but is perhaps best known as being a production manager or supervisor on a number of popular television shows, including Batman, The Green Hornet, Lassie, and M.A.S.H. He lived to be 96. There's an upright wall nearby. On the south face we find Don DeFore. As an actor he began appearing on stage and in films in the 30s and 40s, like The Male Animal, but would go on to find his greatest success on television. He's remembered for his Emmy-nominated role as Thorny Thornberry on The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet, and as George Baxter on Hazel. Don DeFore also opened and operated a restaurant at Disneyland, The Silver Banjo Barbecue. He died from cardiac arrest at the age of 80. Don was married to Marion Holmes, a noted singer of the big band era. She and Don met and married while she was a singer in Art Castle's band. Judy Garland was the matron of honor at their wedding. While in Castle's band, Marion recorded and made I'm a Little Teapot famous. Oh, I'm a little teapot, short and stout. Here is my handle, here is my handle. I'm a little She lived to be 93. Let's head just east to a familiar section. In our original tour, we visited legendary director Billy Wilder. Resting here alongside Billy is his wife, Audrey Young. Like Marion Holmes, she began her career as a well-known singer of the big band era, singing for legends like Tommy Dorsey. She then transitioned into acting, becoming a contract player at Paramount in the 40s, in films like Follow That Woman and Love Me or Leave Me. She quit acting shortly after her marriage to writer-director Billy Wilder, but Billy would call on her talents in his own films, bringing her on as a costume consultant for Some Like It Hot and The Apartment. Audrey lived to be 89. And if you're curious what this witty epitaph means here on Billy's Stone, it's a whimsical allusion to the final line of one of his best-known films, Some Like It Hot. One of the great final lines in movie history, between Joe E. Brown and Billy's neighbor here at Westwood, Jack Lemmon. But you don't understand, Osgood! Uh, I'm a man! Well, nobody's perfect. Having circumnavigated the cemetery, let's move to the middle. Starting on the east side, near Burt Lancaster, is Janet Margolin. She's best remembered for her haunting performance in David and Lisa, playing a schizophrenic teen who alternately only speaks in rhymes or can only write to communicate. The role earned her a Golden Globe nomination for Most Promising Newcomer. Other films include Annie Hall and the thriller Last Embrace. Her final film appearance was in Ghostbusters 2. Janet was just 50 when she died from ovarian cancer. Further into the lawn we go. Here lies actor Richard Anderson. He's perhaps best remembered for his role as Oscar Goldman on both The Six Million Dollar Man and The Bionic Woman, and their various film adaptations. Fast forwarding to the 90s, Anderson was narrator of the series Kung Fu, The Legend Continues. You also saw him in around a dozen episodes of Perry Mason, and in movies like Forbidden Planet. Richard Anderson died in 2017 at age 91. Continuing west along this row, we find French actor Louis Jordan. His film career began in France in the 30s, but was interrupted by the outbreak of World War II 
during which time he joined the French Resistance. After the war, he went to Hollywood. His first big film was Hitchcock's The Paradine Case. I will tell you about Mrs. Paradine. She's bad, bad to the bone. He would go on to portray the suave romantic continental in films like Letter from an Unknown Woman and Gigi, which earned him a Golden Globe nomination. Fans of Swamp Thing will remember him for playing Anton Arcane in the 1982 film, and James Bond fans will remember him as Kamal in Octopussy. Louis lived to be 93. Turn your compass north toward the skyscrapers. In our original tour, we visited Bob Crane, star of shows like Hogan's Heroes. Resting here alongside Bob is his wife, Sigrid Valdis. She performed alongside her husband in Hogan's Heroes as Hilda, Colonel Klink's secretary. She also played Miss Piecemeal on The Wild Wild West. She and Bob married in 1970 and were together until his murder in 1978. Sigrid retired from acting after Hogan's Heroes and lived to be 72, dying from lung cancer in 2007. A few spaces north we find Norma Crane. The actress of stage and screen is perhaps best remembered for her portrayal of Golda in the 1971 film adaptation of Fiddler on the Roof. And now I'm asking Golda. Do you love me? I'm your wife! I know! Do I love him? Well? Other films include Tea and Sympathy, and her TV appearances include Have Gun, Will Travel, The Untouchables, and Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Norma's career was cut short when she died from breast cancer. Her birth year is incorrect here, she was 44. Norma was close friends with Natalie Wood, who helped pay her funeral costs, and would eventually be laid to rest just a few spaces away. Turning back toward the southwest, let's revisit the Albert grave. You'll recall that Eddie Albert was the star of shows like Green Acres and films like Roman Holiday. Eddie's wife was also a popular actress, who went by the mononym Margot. Born in Mexico, Margot was an actress and dancer, often cast in exotic roles that showcased her dancing. Her best-known role was that of Maria in the 1937 film Lost Horizon. Other films include Miracle on Main Street and I'll Cry Tomorrow. Eddie and Margot were married for 40 years until her death from brain cancer at the age of 68. Continuing southwest toward the office, we find the grave of Patricia Berry. While she did have a number of film and stage roles, most of her work was in television on daytime soap operas like Guiding Light and Loving, and dramas like Dr. Kildare and Perry Mason. She also had memorable turns in The Twilight Zone, in the episodes I Dream of Jeannie and The Chaser. Roger, you are acting like a, a clod, a silly, stupid, sophomoric clod. I love you. Stop saying that. I... Patricia lived to be 93. In the nearby urn garden, we find the plaque of Robert Newton. He's best known for playing the quintessential pirate of the 50s, the definitive Long John Silver in Disney's Treasure Island, and on the TV series The Adventures of Long John Silver. His portrayal and style of speech have come to define what we consider pirate talk. Arr. Parroted by everyone from the sea captain on The Simpsons to half the cast of Pirates of the Caribbean. If I'm captain, then this is orders. All hands ashore, except Israel and Agatha. Aye, aye, sir. If you're in trouble, you can signal me by fire in the cannon. Aye, sir. There. And when you're doing sentry go, just ease off a point on the rum. Yeah. Newton also played Blackbeard in Blackbeard the Pirate in 1952. So, come September 19th, International Talk Like a Pirate Day, be sure to give a shout out to Robert Newton here. Perhaps in true pirate form, alcohol was his poison, his chronic use of which led to a fatal heart attack at the age of 50. Finally, we head a little farther west to find the grave of Perry Lafferty. He was a television producer and director for CBS beginning in the 50s. His early work was directing shows like Robert Montgomery Presents and The Twilight Zone. He'd go on to be head of programming at CBS and later NBC, introducing classic shows like All in the Family, M.A.S.H., M.A.U.D., and The Mary Tyler Moore Show. His programming was unique in that he was not afraid to address controversial issues of the day, like racism, drugs, and even HIV AIDS. His innovative programming kept CBS at the top of the ratings for years. 
Perry Lafferty died in 2005, and has now gone on to that great control room in the sky. And that concludes our tour. What are some of your favorite memories of the stars we visited today? Share them in the comments below, and be sure to like, share, and subscribe for more famous grave tours. Thanks for watching, we'll see you on the next one. Frank Zappa fans may have noticed something curious recently. Online forums have long indicated that Frank Zappa is buried in the plot immediately to the right of actor Lou Ayers. Our original tour videos reflected that. But recently, a marker has been placed on that spot that does not belong to Frank Zappa. I'm not moving closer in in deference to the privacy of that individual. I asked the cemetery about this and while they do confirm that Frank Zappa is interred here on the grounds, they do not reveal his exact location. So no, Frank hasn't been moved or doubled up. Images online have simply misidentified the exact spot. Bear in mind that these are tiny cremation plots, so we're talking a matter of inches. It's likely that instead of being to the right of Ayers, he's along this row below. But again, that's just speculation, until either a marker is placed or the cemetery confirms his exact location. Neither of which are likely to happen anytime soon, as Zappa wished to remain unmarked.